Hello, everyone. It's August 13th, 12.05 p.m. Here's the chart of my bhakti yoga guru, Sarah Willow. And yeah, these are some examples that I'm going to give you guys to help you understand seeing some spiritual stuff in a chart. A uh, little bit on bhakti yoga. Uh, so there are different paths of yoga in the classic ancient Hinduism that we, it's things are, I don't know, there's different yoga paths now that people have created, but there was sort of like these initial ancient ones. There was bhakti, the path of devotion, which is through merging with God through love and devotion. Then there was the path of uh, jnana or knowledge and inquiring into what is my essence? What is the self? And waking up through understanding and knowledge and understanding that you, you know, you are that self. Um, then there is the path of karma yoga, which is the path of service, which is basically just, well, let's not create any more karma and let's start undoing the karma that we do have by serving others and generating positive karmas. And then there is Raja yoga, which is the kingly yoga or the, uh, the eightfold yoga path as it's sometimes called Ashtanga yoga, which is basically um, the do's and don'ts, the yamas and niyamas, and then, you know, getting your body pure through not doing the things you shouldn't do and doing things you should do. Then the asana and then the, the internalization of the intention, the pranayama and so on and so forth. And you go through the eight steps and then you can experience samadhi and eventually wake up through that. So those are the four main paths. Uh, Kriya Yoga is a part of Raja Yoga. Um, so that counts also as Raja Yoga. Then there's just like all these other kind of like more embellished things that people do nowadays. And you hear about all this other stuff. So I'm not going to go into all that. Um, but that's, those are the initial ancient yoga paths. And those are all amazing ways to wake up. And really the further you go down the paths, the more they all start to blend and merge together. Um, and so if you're on one path, don't worry about, oh, should I be doing another thing? Just, just go deep down that path and eventually we'll merge in with the rest. So a little bit about me, I kind of, I'm a very intellectually centered person that I, I you know, I had a lot of that going on for me when I was younger. And so the dhyana and the self-inquiry and the knowledge paths work really well for me. And also, though, I'm very devotional and um, feeling oriented. And so bhakti was very, very good for me as well. And then, of course, Raja Yoga as well. Um, you know, Kriya Yoga, I've talked about how good that is for me as well. I'm doing, doing that classic Raja Yoga practice is very, very useful. So, you know, I'm an example of someone who does more than one. At, at one point, though, I was very, very intellectually dhyana focused and meditation focused, and I got initiated into Kriya Yoga, but something was missing. I was forgetting my heart, and I was losing sight. I wasn't sure what was missing, but something felt like it was missing. And I prayed for a good teacher and a good guide who could keep me going and, and show me what I was missing. I was praying very deeply about this when I was living in the mountains all alone before we had the phones and before internet and stuff and the smartphones and all that. I was just very alone before Facebook, all this stuff, doing all this meditation and doing Kriya Yoga and all. Something just wasn't quite fitting for me. And I, and then after a while, after praying, then a few weeks later, the redneck crazy neighbor that I had in the mountains moved out and then um, this woman moved in. And she had pictures of this guru in her room and sticking out of her window and everything. Like it was just no one would walk by it for me. There was only one other person, my roommate, who would walk by it and who was able to see it. I was just this uh, pictures of this avatar, Maribaba, this guru. This guy. I'll just say that he looks happy like that for a reason. And I'll just say that he is everything he says he is. He is an avatar of Lord Vishnu, the same as Christ, Jesus, Ram, Buddha, Muhammad, Zoroaster. But he's not, he's not like super well known. You wouldn't think that. It will probably be another hundred years before he is as well known as Ram or Krishna or any of those. And you have to remember that Ram wasn't, you know, Krishna, all these people weren't 
known legendarily like they are now at the time they were alive. They were actually often hated. And we have evidence of Ram being hated since, you know, he had to be exiled. He had a whole kingdom, you know. Then we have Krishna. Well, yeah, we have tons and tons of examples of Krishna being hated by very powerful people, very powerful kshatriyas in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And then, you know, we have, even with Muhammad, we have really, really great documented evidence of Muhammad being hated um, and the world opposing him. Um, and then go back to Jesus. Well, the Pharisees, the Romans, they crucified him, literally. So one thing you have to understand that a lot of people don't get is that the avatar is never meant to be embraced by the whole world. And that's not what it's about. And this whole fantasy that people keep carrying on of like, one day Jesus is going to just show up and make us all love him and bow down. And the ones who don't bow down, they get punished. That is the most foolish, dualistic viewpoint. Get that out of your head if it was ever in your head. No, the avatar comes, but only for the ones who are awake enough to see it, to hear it, to feel it, and to get awakened from that. Uh, otherwise, no, he, those other people walk right past God on the street, and they'll never see him. So that's essentially what, what Avatar Mir Baba's life was, was everywhere he went, everywhere he walked, the people who had, were truly, truly working on God, like there are so many accounts of, you know, like these sadhus who would, you know, hold their arm up for years and years at a time and would just have the most incredible austerities, only meditating. Mir Baba's car would drive by that village in India in, in the 30s, and he would get out and walk about, and he'd walk up to that person, and that sadhu, who normally wouldn't have spoken for like five years or something, he would, he would just start shouting out, Shiva, Shiva, you are Shiva, oh my God, and just be like transforming and just going, losing himself in bliss and intoxication of God. And this happened everywhere Baba went, except for when he was, except for when there was no one awake enough to appreciate it or to see it. But that's another story for another day. But Mary Baba, you can, there's tons of documentaries about him, but no one knows about him. And that is correct. That is exactly how that should be at this yuga at this time. And astrology shows all of that, just so you know. So if you look into Mary Baba and you're wondering why the world, why doesn't mainstream Hinduism talk about him? Well, that's exactly how it is supposed to be. And if an avatar just showed up and was like, oh, I'm Jesus, I'm floating in the heavens. You have to understand that. What would that actually cause us to do inwardly? What would that actually create? That wouldn't create an iota of spirituality in a single human being on the planet. That's what Mary Baba says, and that's the truth, because think about it. If you did that, then you saw that shining being up in the sky, we would all just go, oh, well, we have to love that. That really is the thing. So we would all love that and then expect that to do things for us. And you see, that's, again, just the selfish, all intertwined with Maya and ego-ridden duality. What the real avatar wants you to do is to love him without expectation of return and not because he showed up and showed you, I am the avatar. No, there's no faith. There's no growth that happens there. You're meant to take a leap of faith in life. You're meant to not know if your choice is right and then go for it anyway. That's what the gods really like to see, and that's what they really validate. And so that's why Jesus is never going to just show up and, you know, shine light on the whole world and be like, oh, and that's why Krishna and Kalki and none of them are ever going to do that, you guys. I'm sorry, but they're not. And because why would they? Then everyone would be forced to love and it wouldn't be real love. They would be being coerced into something. Um, maybe right now Jesus is shining up in the heavens already. And if you had the eyes, the divine eyes to see it, you could see it. And then that would help transform you because you transform yourself and you willed it. Out of your own free will, you wanted to see that. But if we don't want to see God, it would not make us grow to see God. All right, so that's a little little tidbit about avatars, gurus, and such. Um, now, when it comes to seeing the chart, seeing how we can see, you know, one being a guru, avatar, a devotee, a guru to a, you know, a devotee to a guru, something like that. You see that the first house has Jupiter, planet of gurus, in it, and 
moon is her Atmakarika. So moon is delighted by Jupiter to begin with, Atmakarika and just her moon in general. And that means that at some point, like she will be really into wisdom or she would acquire wisdom or would need to find a guru or something like that in her path. Um, but Scorpio as a path is a really, really tough path. Um, as, as you all know, here, let me pull up my notes here. The chart of my Bhakti Yoga Guru, Sarah Willow. Being a Scorpio, her path was a path of poison, pitfalls, emotional vulnerabilities, having to transform into something that can somehow survive what life is throwing at her. Um, so it was a very, you know, Scorpio right away is a tough path. It's one of the toughest, especially if Mars isn't strong. So then we look to Mars, the ruling planet, and it's not strong. It's afflicted in the eighth house with Rahu. So Rahu's impairing it, or Vikala, the Vashta. Uh, Mars is starved in Gemini, his enemy is sign. He's in a neutral dignity, though, because Mercury's right there. So that's a little better. Um, yeah, so this is a person who definitely suffered, definitely had to learn a lot of lessons about having to assert herself with Mars there and just had a tough path. Let me get a sip of water real quick. So she, uh, she also has Kala Sarpa Yoga. When all the planets are on one side of the lunar nodes, that's a very, very tough yoga to have. It makes one very extreme. Um, it's really, really extremely imbalanced in their life. Um, and they, they just usually live a very extreme life. But what's cool is if it's going towards K2, it's a very, usually, usually, I don't always see it this way, but usually it's a very spiritual type of life that you're seeing happening. If the rest of the chart speaks to it, if it's going towards Rahu, it might be like your really, really crazy, crazy Kalasarpa yoga person. Um, but I know that in the chart of like Donald Trump, that's not the case because he's got going all towards K2. I don't know. Don't really see him. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> uh, all right. So, mm. yeah, the there was abuse in her house growing up and there was abuse from her father. I know particularly. I don't know a lot of the details. We can We can guess a hint because of having – it, her being a Scorpio already and having the ruling planet in the eighth uh, with Rahu. But that would just mean some kind of really tough things. The reason we can see the, see the father abuse is because the 10th house, of, the son is the father, 10th house is the father. In the 10th house, we see son with Saturn and son and Saturn starving each other. They're great enemies and sun Saturn conjunctions, one of the worst conjunctions you can have, especially when it comes to, fatherhood issues um and yeah it's just really tough because basically like the person's lower self is always fighting with their higher self so they're always trying to like compensate for who they think they should be but they feel all these weaknesses of saturn like you know holding them back so they're so frustrated and angry and agitated all the time it's just it can it's a really agitated masculinity we see um in this chart in the house of the father the ninth cusp deals with parents um, as well so that's very tough very very tough um and then that rahu mars is a placement for learning to fight for yourself learning to be independent more alone more uh, mars is a brahmachari planet you know and so she never married and she was single in her life so that's probably very good for her um, but yeah, she did have just a terrible life and, uh, in terms of worldly happiness. And there were a lot of difficult things that she had to contend with. Um, but uh, let's look at it a little bit deeper. Um, from a deeper objective standpoint, what really happened in this life, her swamsha is Aquarius. Aquarius is a very common, yeah, here you can see the swamsha, the moon. Um, the moon is in Aquarius. And so... Uh, that's a very common swamp shift for spiritual figures, monks, uh, renunciates, as well as celebrities too, though. And it's like at the end of the Zodiac, and it's, a, it's, it's when one really starts to become very individualized as a soul and then starts to share that gift with the world. 
So of course, renunciates and also celebrities will, will oftentimes have an Aquarius Swamp Ship. Aquarius Swamp Ship is basically about, I'm trying to make life more bearable for everyone um, because I can see how unbearable life is in my own human existence, basically. Um, or it can play out different ways. That's one of the ways it can play out. In the context of spirituality, the ninth house from the Swamsha shows if you can follow a guru uh, or be a guru devotee, as J Jaimini says. Rahu's there in the ninth, which is like, no, you're going to struggle with that or have to work on that. But she does have the moon Rashi aspecting it, a benefic moon Rashi aspecting it. So that's a classic placement for Jaimini saying she would be a guru devotee. So she had a really, really tough life. One of those like hippie, probably like flower child people from the 50s and 60s, or you know, well, she was born, yeah, so then from the uh, 60s, she was like, you know, a young, um, she was right there. She lived through this crazy 60s time, you know what I mean? Um, she lived in the woods for like a decade, I know, like completely on her own, um, a lot of things like that. And, but could never find anything in the world for her. You know what I mean? There was just never anything in the world for her to do, nothing. She couldn't seem to heal easily from her past. And it was just, you know, trying to escape this pain until she found her, her guru, um, who was Mer Baba, the avatar Mer Baba, the guy who was talking about in the beginning of this video. So when she found that guru, she could finally just surrender and just serve him and love him. And through that, the rest of her life didn't outwardly crazy change or anything, but she became happy. She became at peace with it. She could move on finally. Um, she would still have suffering. She would still not be able to move on from everything. She wasn't perfect. She would still suffer and have uh, emotional episodes, but all the stuff she had been through, the stuff she told me about, the stuff um, I could kind of tell uh, just from what I knew of astrology back then, which wasn't much. Um, yeah, you know, it, it was like, wow, I can see that this is, this is different for me because I'm used to just intellectualizing my way out of situations or finding God through intellect and then through Kriya Yoga and Raja Yoga. There's more of this sense of like, I need to be doing all these things to feel pure and to, and to connect to God. And that's true. Those things help you. But there is this, something was just lost in that and seeing this woman who was completely dysfunctional and completely okay with it and just completely surrendered to it and happy at the same time still, because she'd found in her heart something that mattered beyond what's good or bad in the world, whether she has a healthy mind or a healthy body or has money in the bank or a nice car or a wife or husband or any of these things. And they're all just these temporary things that are going to leave you at some point, but your essence of being isn't going to leave you. It's always going to be that. So she had somehow connected to that better through Baba and the rest is history sort of. So she never, uh, her life. It's interesting. So here, let me keep going. Um, the other important house for spirituality is the 12th from the swamp shit to see the state of one's afterlife as well as the faith they have and what deities uh, they have faith in and what aspects of the divine they will have faith in. So if sun is in the 12th from your swamp shit, that's very good for like a Hatha yoga or a Shiva path of uh, doing lots of fiery meditation and pranayama and all this stuff, you know, um, very active. The sun is active. If it's Venus or the moon in the 12th from your swamp shit, those are the passive planets. So you have a more passive planet, a uh, passive path of devotion, of not necessarily having to like meditate all day, but just becoming receptive to God when God flows through you. Um, so Venus in the 12th there shows that she was a bhak bhakti yoga was the path for her. I hope that makes sense. Um, Venus in the 12th also is showing that she had faith in Lakshmi. Um, so then also Venus in the 12th from the Swamsha is a placement showing that she would go to a blissful realm in her afterlife. And uh, that seems very, very likely. Um, if I had to guess, I can't prove that though, you know, but that does seem very likely. Um, 
So we've established that she is a guru devotee. She is a bhakti yoga. She will go to a higher realm, but her life is completely terrible <laughs> in terms of a material standpoint. Yeah, so that's what we established there. Also, this is very interesting. Jupiter is strong in Sagittarius in her Navamsha. And this likely has to do with why she had the merit to find a truly awake Jupiter, wide awake, a Jagrat guru, um, a very exalted guru. And her guru is Mir Baba, the avatar of Vishnu. So isn't it kind of cool that Jupiter is with Mercury, Vishnu? So the guru is with the Vishnu planet. So her guru was an avatar of Vishnu. And notice that that is in the 12th from the Lagna of the Navamsha. Not as important as the Jaimini 12th from Swamsha, but very important too. Um, from her Swamsha, from her Swamsha moon in Aquarius, that Jupiter, Mercury, is forming an Argola. That's very important. And it's not blocked because there's only one embodied planet, which is Exalted Sun. Um, so that's very interesting. Um, And then if we use the D60, uh, so hope you guys can see this D60 chart here. Um, in from the ascendant, moon Abhakaraka is in the fifth, uh, in a in another um, Brahmin or Moksha sign of Scorpio. You see Scorpio coming up a lot, that moon's of Argatama. Um, from that Atmakarika, reading at the Jaimini way, from the Atmakarika, look, Venus is exalted in the ninth. So that really confirms that she, the end of her life, the thing she would come to, the D60 final fulfillment, uh, connecting to that exalted Venus is showing why she was devoted to, an, her, she had exalted devotion to a guru. And there are so many people who act like they're devoted who dramatize their devotion, who chant loudly when people are around, or who wear all these beads like outside, like they're like, they want you to see their beads, you know, and they want like rings and all this like stuff. And they're just like, they're really not there when you know it deep down when you get to know them or when you see the chart. This woman was the complete opposite. She was a complete mess. She was like, I don't know. I'm a complete mess. I just say Baba's name. <laughs> she would tell me, don't forget to say Baba's name. <laughs> she would just be telling me, okay, good night. Say Baba's name. <laughs> At first, I thought she was totally crazy. Not, I mean, yeah, sort of did. But um, And then it, it just rubbed off on me, and it just grew on me in my heart. And before I knew it, I was doing the same thing and saying Baba's name when I went to bed. Um, it's pretty amazing. Uh, notice also that the moon is still debilitated even, or actually even closer to true debilitation, the D60. So no, like her mind, she didn't like strengthen her mind or didn't like improve her life or her, like overcome her vulnerabilities. Like I talk about in other things. No, for some people that's just, it's too much. Some people have too much stuff, too many heavy sanskaras and they just need to surrender them all to, to God. And then God deals with them. Um, and so, yeah, so this is a really good example of that. So if you have too much stuff in your chart and you're a Scorpio like her, and it's just, it's just too overwhelming, there's always the path of bhakti and the path of devotion. There's always that. <sighs> and you can also see in her Rashi chart, the path of her life, Two benefics are in the ninth house, and Mercury is one of them. Planet of Vishnu, again. Yeah, so that's pretty much everything um, that I saw in this chart. So this is an example that I really think, you know, I just, I wanted to share with you guys because a lot of y'all that are studying and just people in general, you're not going to always see a good chart. What can you tell that person? Well, if you see a lot of these strong bhakti yoga placements and you see that they're a water sign, they have a lot of these spiritual tendencies, um, yeah, you know, maybe just, maybe just try to um, encourage them to, that maybe it's okay if they don't make a great worldly life. Maybe it's time to make this life the life where you start to merge um, 
and not focus so much on this worldly evolution, but maybe focus on involution um, and finding out what's, you know, what, what's the real purpose for all of us? Why are we here? Um, so yeah, hope you guys enjoy that. If you want to learn more about uh, Mehra Baba, you can always visit the, um, if you're in India, you can go to Meherabad where his Samadhi is. Or if you're in America, you can go to the Myrtle Beach Mare Spiritual Center. Or you can uh, watch all the documentaries about him. God Speaks is a really amazing documentary. Um, lots of lots of interesting stuff about that. And if you don't, if you're not into that, that's fine. But uh, you have to understand that if you're going to watch my channel, I'm really into spirituality and yoga. Um, that's that's me. You know, like the text message. I don't know if you heard it, but I just got a text message that I was saying that I'm going to keep talking about this stuff. And if you're not into it, that's fine. But there's many other uh, astrology YouTubers now that are much more of a secular nature. So you can go watch them and that's fine. But uh, I'm going to keep talking about God and my love for God and, you know, all these spiritual things. And if that's too preachy, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just go elsewhere. <laughs> all right. Jay Baba. Take care, you guys.